Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC on ESPN9. Yes, Cody Safdick, we are going back to the numbers because we're in Jacksonville far too much. Uh, main event is Walt Harris versus Alistair Overeem. Before we get to any of this stuff, and before I bring in my, bo- my boy, the GOAT, Cody Safdick, just want to say, I mean, Cody, are in the knockout stage of the uh, uh, MMA World Cup. Uh, Brett Appley's pool that he runs... I believe there's 32 people left, 36, either way. Uh, we're head-to-head right now. So um, we're going to go through. We're going to give you all of our regular picks as per usual. We're not going to really go on to the draft. We're not going to go on to the DraftKings slate, though. Um, you'll have a great sense of who we like, who we don't like. But, I mean, people listen to the pod. Cody, filthy Frankster, who's known in our MMA betting community, is taking on Cody. He listens to the show. So we just want to give, you know, we, we, there's a belt to be won. It's not even about the money. There's a belt to be won at the, all, at the end of all of this. And we want to win that belt. I want that belt. When quarantine gets lifted, I want that belt on the PME set if I win. I guess Cody would have it at home um, or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way. We're going through all the picks. Check the time codes for all of that stuff. But uh, DraftKings, we're going we're gonna to skip uh, this week. Cody Safdick, what's going on, bud? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's going to be a rough card either way. You'll basically get our leads going through the actual betting side of things because we're going to give you our opinion. But <clears throat> regardless, and I think most people that have looked at the slate so far, like the high end doesn't look good. Not only like maybe you're picking them to win, but doesn't you don't get a feel there's going to be a lot of finishes on this card or like a lot of guys that score a ton. But we'll see. So, yeah, glad to be back yet again, Paul. And hopefully we can route this out with a three and three over these three Jacksonville cards. That'd be cool in itself. And uh, keep the good, and then we get a two week break, right? So, one more event, let's get her done, let's get some winning picks out there, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then kind of go on a vacation, even though we've been trapped inside the house for two months. So, it doesn't sound like much of a vacation, but you know what I mean. All right, in the main event, we have Walt Harris taking on Alistair Overeem. Walt Harris minus 140 favorite. Alistair Overeem can be had. For plus 125, I already know where I stand on this one. I'm interested to hear your take first, and then I'll jump off of that. Cody Safdick, take it away. Yeah, so this is the only thing I'll mention on it because I don't want to get too much into it, but the whole like personal stuff that happened, and obviously it's very tragic with Walt Harris. I, I don't know if that's the reason why the line is the way it is, but I just don't see why Walt Harris would be a slight favorite to open up over Alistair Overeem to begin with um he's extremely athletic he's gonna have a big speed advantage he's got a big power i don't want to say power advantage but he's got big power certainly enough to knock out alistair over him if he touches him you can talk all day about how many times alistair over him has been knocked out and this and that but there's no denying that alistair over him is a smart fighter <clears throat> he realizes he's not the demolition man anymore he realizes he's not ubery he's not body kicking people he's not slamming knees into them he's not smoking these guys over the striking like he's kind of one of those guys that's realized geez i can't be banging out with these young up-and-coming heavyweights or pretty much most heavyweights got a smarter fight got to fight a smarter game plan and that's what you're seeing out of it if he just smart fights a smarter game plan against Walt Harris tries to you know maybe drag him into some deeper waters that's where he's going to have some success as much as you can look back at Walt Harris's last two fights and you see the power on display no doubt about it mm-hmm. he knocks out Sergey speed back in 50 seconds he knocks out Alexei Olenek in 12 seconds we went over Olenek's cool but yep. keep in mind, Olenek's way slower than him. Like, he's going to have his way all day with him, and he gets to him. The fight with Spivak, it's Spivak, who I believe since been cut. The two fights before that, that's what we're going to zone in on here and focus on. The Andre Arlovsky fight, Paul. The first round, he looks like Walt Harris. He's yep. throwing heater. He looks good in the first round. It's once, probably about the three-minute mark of the first round is when he starts to tie. And you don't notice that in his last two fights because the fight's over already. But around the three-minute mark of the fight with Andre Arlovsky, third to tie. He wins the first round because he gets the better punches off. He loses round two. In the third round, it's like, okay, it's 1-1 against a 39-year-old Andre Orlovsky. I got to get after it. Maybe he gets after it enough. Maybe he doesn't. Judges say 2-1, to one, split decision, Walt Harris, and then he tests positive for steroids after that. Should have looked great considering he tests positive for SARMs, but didn't look good. It's the three-minute mark where Walt Harris starts to just 
it starts to fall apart. The fight before that, Daniel Speets, if you just want to look at it on paper, he knocked out Speets with one second left of the second round. And it is a decent little knockout. You watch that fight, the fans are booing. They're booing because Wall Harris is not doing anything. He's just standing there. This is a guy that relies a little too much on the power. No doubt about it. If he hits you clean, you're down. He's a 265 pound heavyweight, Paul. No doubt. Or, you know, he, he's not too Of course. Yep. Sorry. He's, he's, he's large heavyweight. Yep. No doubt if he hits you, he's going to be able to put you down. It's the guy that can kind of extend him out a little bit. He's not this murderous puncher that you think he's going to be. And Overeem, yeah, he got caught at 457 against Rosenstruck, but he's fought five rounds in his career before. He knows how to drag fights out a little bit deeper. He's got decent enough striking to hopefully just not get caught early. <clears throat> and the last point I'm gonna is nobody tries to take down Walt Harris. In the last three and a half years, two guys have attempted one takedown on him. He's had to defend two takedowns in the last three and a half years. One against Fabrice Verdum. Verdum took him down and submitted him like 40 seconds later. And one against Andre Arlovsky, which happens like 90 seconds into the first round. And it's not even a real takedown. Watch it again. You could hardly even say it's a takedown. It's a very lackluster attempt. No one's even attempted to shoot a takedown on this guy. Mm-hmm. So, so how can we cap him as a favorite when we don't know if Overeem's just not going to land a takedown in the first round and then absolutely butcher him? Like, There's just too many unknowns about his ground game. There's too many unknowns about his gas tank. There's too many unknowns about his personal life. Mm-hmm. And to top all that off, He's yep. 37 years old yep. with a quarantine camp coming yep. into this place. So that's right. Yep. All of it. All of it. All of it. You're right about Um, I actually took some at plus 145 last night, Alistair Overeem. I think I would bet him all the way up to minus 150, which would be an implied probability of 60%. Like, I think he wins six out of ten times against Wall Harris at the very least. Maybe seven out of ten. In this situation, he was up on all three judges' scorecards, um, three to one. Now, I know that we've talked about this fight a million times. We definitely don't have to go through this conversation again. I know that you had it scored for Rosenstrike, and then it would have been a 10 8 anyway, based on that drop. But uh, if he, you know, one pit punch slips a little bit, he blocks that punch, he beats Rosenstrike on all, all judges' scorecards. 40 uh, 48 47 it would have been um yeah he's got a better grappling game better wrestling he's seen all of the striking that Walt Harris could possibly ever throw his way over him sound I listened to his interview yesterday he sounded pretty fresh he thought he kind of got like robbed by the judge like I know his face blew up but he's just like man it's like three seconds like I can get to the bell and I feel like they kind of stole that one away from me and then they were asking about Anaya Blanchard and how that affects him he's just like listen man this is all business I'm really mad I want to like get back on track I need this win I, I heard everything I wanted from Alistair over him he sounds like he's on He's on a mission to get the uh, get back on track here, keep his uh, keep the checks coming in, and uh, he said, "Yeah, like I, I I respect him. It's obviously a very very tough situation, but we can have a glass of wine afterwards. It's business when we get in there. So yeah, Overeem at plus money is an absolute gift. Get on that, I think. Anything final to say to that? No, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. I mean, <clears throat> if you want to d- dive into the DK side of that, I agree. If he's going to lose, he's caught early. I just don't see him getting caught early. Sure. And I think that's where you drag out Wall Harris. I rewatched, and the last thing I want to add on that is I rewatch, obviously, the tape study of this fucking card. Yep. I rewatch Alistair Overeem. Struck. Overeem doesn't look good in the fight. But yes, he's up three rounds. He mm-hmm. loses the fourth. It's 3 1 at this point. He loses, the, he loses the fifth. I don't even have that 10 8 with the drop. And I'm going to be honest with you, it was an early stoppage. Not only is there just three seconds left on it, how many guys get dropped and immediately stand fucking back up? Mm-hmm. Is, is the man like, now, now he's wobbly as hell when he stands up, but that's what happens when you go down from a big shot and you, you try to pop back up like that. You're a little discombobulated. He pops right back up. There's three seconds. Rosenstruck already walked away. It wasn't like he was trying to swarm him. It just it was just optics, man. Should, should have let that continue. Yep. Plus, I lost a lot of money on that when he stopped it, but... <laughs> Regardless. Yeah, that one cost yeah, me it, two it, grand. It, so so now I'm I'm taking into consideration geez, well Rosenstruck was that big power puncher. That's why Overeem didn't really try to engage with him in the striking. And that's why also Overeem decided to shoot multiple takedowns, took him down twice. That's not something he usually does. But again, we're talking with smart fighter. He recognizes don't want to stand and bang with this guy. So the last point that I'm making is if he goes in with that game plan to slow down the first early round, is Walt Harris gonna pull a Rosenstruck and pull out that fourth or fifth round KO? 
I don't think so because as we just talked about, he's got gas cons himself. He's probably not going to carry that power in the fourth and fifth round and catch him late like needed. So yeah, it's it's, it's the dog play, right? If Overeem's the favorite, I'd be like, eh, Harris might catch him. Even at like my yeah. Overeem that's the favorite, it's like, yeah, he might go in there and do what he's got to do. So that's what I'm going with. Yeah, even as a slight favorite, I wouldn't mind it too much. But let's move on. We have uh, Claudia Gadella taking on Angela Hill in the strawweight division. Claudia Gadella is minus 210 favorite angela hill plus 175 what's your take here i mean if you were going to tailor make a fighter to just absolutely dominate angela hill it would be claudia gadelia outside of the fact that like claudia Gidelli can't sustain that kind of pace or that pressure for more than around it seems like mm-hmm. she has been a mega bust so far she's only 31 years old so yeah the argument's definitely there that she's going to come around or she's she she could come around or she could improve. But Paul, honestly, I looked at this. If you look at basically her entire run in the UFC, it's been underwhelming. Her UFC debut, she's a minus five sixty favorite wins a decision over Tina Landamaki. Her second fight in the UFC, she was a minus 300 favorite over JJ and lost. So just two fights in the UFC already. It's like, she's underwhelming for what this massive odds on her, but her other wins, she beats Jessica Aguilar. That's not impressive. She was one in four in the UFC. Mm-hmm. She loses to what Joanna again. Went over Courtney Casey. She didn't look good. She smokes through Carolina. That's one little credit for her. Then she looks good in the first round against Jessica Andrade. Gas, gas is out, fades off. Yep. Next fight, Carlos Sparza. This is key to me. She lost that Carlos Sparza fight, in my opinion. Gets gifted the split. Carlos Sparza drops her in the first round. Now, I mean, wobbles her. She stanky legs her. Carla Esparza hasn't knocked out an opponent with strikes in eight years. She's got two TKO victories in her entire 26-fight career. She's not a power punch in the slightest bit, and yet she hurts Jessica Aguilar. To, at this point, like I'm saying, I think it's overachieving. Then she fights Nina Ansarov. Again, she looks good in the first round yeah. and fades off. Random Marcos, she looks good in the first round and fades off. All of her fights is just the same pattern. The thing is, is that all of those girls <clears throat> know how to wrestle. Random Marcos is a wrestler. Nina Ansarov, not a wrestler, but just spent so much time at ATT that the takedown defense is on point for that fight. Carlos Spar is a wrestler. Jessica Andrade is a wrestler. I think that's why she's having so much trouble, is these girls are making her work very, very hard in the first round, mm-hmm. and therefore she's running out of gas, and that's her problem. Angela Hill will just give up the takedown very easily, and when you watch Angela Hill fight off her back in all of her fights, it's not pretty, man. It's not pretty at all. She's got a great gas tank. Yeah. She just keeps going. She's got the tools that if Claudia Gidelia just works and works and works and works that opening round, then she could pull it off based on volume down the stretch. But I don't know. This is tailor made for just Claudia just needs two takeouts. One in the first, one in the second. Hill does another stopping power to take her out in the third, 29 28. Everyone goes home. Yeah, it makes sense to me. At the price, at the current price of like minus 210, I'm not really interested in Goodella. I, all of those points make sense. I'm just kind of looking at all of her recent fights. So against Marcos, she only attempted one takedown. I know Marcos can wrestle, but like, I mean, if she comes out here trying to to stand and trade with Angela Hill, Angela Hill's got the longer reach. Like that could be definitely very, very interesting between the two of them. Against Ansarov, it was two of ten uh, takedowns. She ends up losing that fight. Four of five landed against Asparza. Asparza, nobody usually tries to shoot takedowns, so that could have been a little bit of like surprise, I guess. But uh, yeah, 0 of seven against Andrade. That Marcos 0, 0, 0 for one is very troubling because in that fight, if you remember. She just really didn't even try to do it. She just kind of accepted the fact that, like, I get tired when I wrestle. So she kind of just cruised to, like, a stand-up decision win. But I don't know, man. Yeah, minus 210, I just can't get on board with it. It's a straight-up pass for me. But, uh, yeah, I think that's my final thoughts. Anything else from you, or should we move on? I mean, might as well keep going, right? Just my last thought on it is, uh, okay, so Mark Henry, great striking coach, great, great coach in general. Obviously, guy's smarter than me. So it, the, his first fight with Claudio Gadelia, who I don't even think with him for this fight, but it was that Ronda Marcos fight, yeah. right? And in that Ronda Marcos fight, she don't throw shit. She doesn't try to wrestle. She doesn't do anything. She just stands there. She just stands there and conserves. And I think that's because he looked at the answer off fight where she gasped. He looked at the Asparza fight where she gasped. He looked at the Andrade. Her last three fights prior to coming to him, she had gassed out, tried to wrestle and go for it. 
So I think he developed the game plan of like, let's not exert yourself and just do enough to win these rounds and, you know, outpoint this girl. She outstruck her, didn't really attempt to wrestle at all. But I think you look at the two prior, the, the fact that she went two t- versus 10 versus answer off. Yeah, I get that's a bad percentage, 20%, but she attempted 10 takedowns, right? She wanted to get the fight to the ground. That at least shows the desire. And then to take down Carlos more than four times, that's no fucking easy joke. So again, she's, she's got all the skills. It was 190, like, I don't know, two hours ago. And then it went to 200 and then it's 210. So money's clearly moving. And this is the kind of card because it's, you know, there's been three in a week and money hasn't really been set on these guys. And everyone's waiting for the Wayans to see what's going on. And there's a lot of fights that are getting booked and this and that, blah, 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 blah. I feel like I don't know what's going to happen to this line. It is it is a little high at 210. I'm going to agree with you there. But I do think Gidelia, you know, if she just fights properly for two rounds, that's all she needs. She's not going to knock down the third. She just needs to do enough to win the first two rounds, two takeouts, all she needs. So, anyways, let's move on. Uh, we've got Edson Barbosa taking on Dan Ige. Here's one of the fights that people were waiting to see the weigh-ins 100%. Edson Barbosa, minus 130 favorite. Dan Ige, plus 110. Listen, man, you know me. I love Habib. My freaking board here says producer, host, Habib fanboy. I'm wearing a Habib hat in the damn picture. Anybody associated with Habib, usually on board. I went into tape on this one. Really wanting to bet Danny Ige. You know, he trains with those boys, uh, at least when they're in Vegas. Uh, he, he spends a bunch of time with his friends with Ali and all of that, and all of that gang. Uh, pretty much everyone associated with Habib I'm on board with Ali, not so much. But that's for a different conversation on a different day. So I went into this really, really wanting to like Dan Ige. I go through his fights and just like Jordan against Jordan Griffin, 3-7 on takedowns. Jordan Griffin was, uh, when he went on take on TJ Brown, 7-7 seven of seven on takedowns. Like... Uh, went through, watched watch those takedowns from Ige. Wasn't all that impressed. Most of his takedowns seemed to come from scrambles. So then I kind of waited. I'm like, all right, well, Edson is going to really, really struggle to make 145. Well, let's wait to see that before we make any decisions. Edson looks pretty good on the scale this morning. I don't know if you agree. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I thought he looked so, good on the scales, actually. So, yeah. Um, I After seeing that, after seeing Edson looking pretty damn good, um, watching the... Kevin Lee and Habib fights against Barbosa. I came to the conclusion, I don't think Dan Ige can follow the template laid by, uh, by, by Lee or Habib. I don't see the wrestling. I don't think the wrestling ability. When he gets to the top position, you can tell those Dagestani boys have definitely uh, given him a trick or two. Like He's got some nice elbows, some nice ground and pound. He doesn't hold position all that well. Um, from those spots, I really think Edson Barbosa, I, I don't know if he's going to finish or by decision, but I like Edson Barbosa quite a bit here now that I've seen that he made weight. What about you? Yeah, I mean, him making weight was huge because when you think about it, how many guys are dropping a weight class during the pandemic? Nobody. Like, almost nobody. Even just on last week's card, right? I feel like Nueva moved up a weight class to make it happen. Brian Kelleher made, moved up a weight class. Mm-hmm. Gabriel Benitez moved up a weight class. Uh, Michael Johnson had previously fought at 45. Felipe Linz had previously fought at 205. Ray Borg had previously fought at 125. Those guys excluded because they all moved up a weight class in that team. So I know OSP moved up a weight class. Yep. Like there was like multiple guys. Mm-hmm. When you look at Edson Barbosa, it's like, geez, man, he's 34 years old. And now for the first time in his career, he's decided to drop down to 45. So like seeing him on, on the scales, like that's extremely important to get a read from him. But yeah, mm-hmm. I think if you think what's the path to beating Edson Barbosa, that's laid out. It's like, okay, well, you either got to be a formidable striker that can stand there and hold your own, or you just got to smother this guy and take him down and dominate him. I feel like the perception is that that is an easy path to victory, but it's not. Mm-hmm. You're right. When you talk about the two guys that did it was Khabib and Kevin Lee, it's like, first of all, Khabib and Kevin Lee are both gigantic mm-hmm. for 155. Yep. They're huge 155ers. They're also both amongst the best. Khabib is the best wrestler in the division. Kevin Lee might be third or fourth probably best wrestlers in the division. You know, Khabib can actually sustain it. Kevin Lee can't, which is why one world champion. You get what I'm saying. Yep. But <clears throat> it's like those guys are the best of the best. The rest of the guys like Dan Hooker and that want to stand with him, and even the Paul Felder fight, like I, I personally thought that Edson Barbosa did enough, and Paul Felder is a world-class Striking. contender. And a, a top guy. So and a no uh, natural 155-pounder. Yeah, you couldn't. And he's fought at 170 as well. Yep. Like you could not. He fought fucking Mike Perry at 170. Do you think Paul Felder could make 145? Not in your wildest dreams there, bud. Like, so Barbosa's going to get a lot of relief in that regard. 
So when I, when I think, okay, Danny Gay's not wrestling to that level, okay, well, that's going to be a big advantage. The other thing, too, is that Kevin Lee and Khabib, especially Khabib again, have great top control. Like, once they do get you to the ground, it's very hard to get back up, you know? Whereas Ige hasn't really shown that. Like, he no. could take you down, potentially, but the He's scramble been, he there and Barbosa is yeah. a black belt. Exactly, he gets scrambled on all the time. Like, Jordan, Jordan Griffin, like, reversed him a couple times, like... Yeah, like I've I've always been betting him, so maybe I've been like you know blinded a little bit by it. But yeah, when I went back and rewatched, I'm like, I don't think this path is here. Like he's gonna have to probably get a knockout, and he's not exactly a, a murderous power puncher. Like uh, he's he's you know he's hurt some guys and been able to swarm on them, but that's that's about it. That's that's really his path here. I think that's his only path, and at plus 110 like i honestly if edson if there wasn't these questions around the uh the weight he would be edson would be minus 200 in my opinion yeah yeah and and, and you know the other thing with uh the last thing probably with Ige as well is that you look at the matchups he's fun it's very low level guy mm-hmm. so he's been able to mike santiago jordan griffin danny henry kevin aguilar let's say that those guys aren't even low level let's say they're all mid-level guys which they're not but let's say they are None of those guys can wrestle particularly. Who's been able to like get that striking match with them? And the only time to- I've lost money on this guy twice uh, on Ige twice, his debut and his last fight. I had Merced picked last time, whatever. Fucking terrible fight. A lot of people told me they thought Merced win. I didn't really care either way. It was just it could have gone either way. Ige got the decision. But his first fight against Julio Arce, I thought Julio was going to keep this guy up and piece this guy up. And if you look at the numbers, Julio keeps this guy up, pieces this guy. You watch this fight, Julio wins the striking exchanges. Problem is the pressure. He does give up a takedown. It's a close fight. He loses. Now with Barbosa is where I find the wonder. If this guy brick walls him and keeps his fight standing and we get a finally Ige in a pure striking match or a kickboxing match, he's going from fighting Mike Santiago, Jordan Griffin, Danny Henry, Kevin Aguilar, Merced Bektic, who landed 17 strikes. Like he wasn't even trying to throw any punches to fighting against Barbosa. Like, geez, that's a big task. So I would give you that little, the little nugget there is on DK, um, it's near this fight. It's currently sitting near Pickham, right? Mm-hmm. But Barbosa is eighty five hundred bucks and Ige is seventy seven hundred dollars. So, like, as far as DK goes, it would be worth having a look at Ige yeah, because yeah, it's not it's not priced properly. But as far as the money line goes, we're giving you a straight pick. It's like Barbosa looked good today, man. He's uh, he's pretty, he's getting my vote of confidence at this point. All right, we got. Uh... Oh, sorry. This one is I didn't make a board for this one because you know what? Historically, I never get these guys right. So I'm probably not going to bet this fight. We got uh, Christoph Jocko taking on Eric Anders. Jocko is minus 155. Anders plus 135. Cody, I can't ever get any of these guys right, so I'm not going to lie. I didn't waste my time trying to figure out the tape on these guys, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes you got to know. It's just like, you know what? You, you, You typically don't have a read on either one of these guys. Now they're fighting each other. This is a... It's a... I'm just... I just don't have interest. In, I have so many other spots on this card that I have interest in betting that I didn't feel like I had to get involved in this one. Uh, do you have a hot take on uh, Jocko versus Anders? Hey, I'd like to have a hotter take for you because I'm liking Jotko, and it's going to take me you know, a more time to delve right into it before I can confidently be like, all right, I'm putting some, some good size money on him. But again, yeah, preliminary thoughts. I've had two days to start looking at it. Well, well doesn't Jocko take Andrews? And that means something, Paul. I'll tell you why. Because you know me, and I fucking am an Eric Andrews guy. Are you? If I can recognize... Oh, do you remember how his nickname is Ya Boy? And it's always like, yeah, my boy. I like Eric Andrews. You said... You said uh, no, came, wait, 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 wait a second. You're just trying to... You're like Trump here, trying to rewrite history or some shit. All right, um... No, you. I remember. I remember. We always, whenever we refer to the uh, Machida versus Anders fight, you always basically hum on Machida's nuts and said that he won that won that fight. Yeah, yeah. Machida totally got <clears throat> totally, totally fucking bullshit, and that's that's what it comes down to. Why he's was my boy. Think about this now. He, he we, we always talked about how he's just such a great athlete. He played at Alabama. You know, he's the captain of of a national title-winning football team in college football. It's like, <clears throat> the guy's got leadership quality. He's a great athlete, blah, 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 blah. Comes to the UFC, he's undefeated, and he's got that pedigree. I like this guy. He beat Brandon Allen, who's in the UFC now, but he beat Brandon Allen for the LFA title, his last fight before coming to the UFC. Looked awesome. I worked the like the fight for Fight Network, like we were showing it. Man, fuck, this guy looks awesome. Comes to the UFC, 
big win over Rafael Nadal, knocks mm-hmm. him out. Oh, man, this is my guy. This is my guy, Paul. Fights Marcus Perez. Not a very pretty fight, but I'm backing him hard, and he beats Marcus Perez. Boom. Now we go into the Leota Machida fight. I'm mm-hmm. backing him against Leota Machida. This is my guy, undefeated. He's so athletic. Machida's over the hill. He doesn't do anything, literally nothing. Now he's headlining, and he's in Brazil, and he's fighting Leota Machida. But he just doesn't do anything, and he loses, and he costs me money. But he's still my boy. And he fights Tim Williams. I, I got him backed because he's my boy. Dude, it's, it's for Tad in the striking. The numbers are the same. You watch the fight. It's like he's in a fucking close striking battle with Tim fucking Williams. And then in the late in the third round, Tim Williams makes the most boneheaded decision ever of trying to stand up from a bad position. Eric Andrews is borderline illegal kick to the head. Just like punts him in the face and knocks him out. So wins me money. He remains my boy. I thought he'd tire out Thiago Sanchez. I really did because I just I bought too much into the hype. And he, he absolutely got a life-changing beating. Then the Elias fights. Like nobody loses to Elias Theodore. But it's like, he just can't track him down. He fought another bonehead game plan and got outstruck by Elias Theodore from the outside just – Never, never brought it on until the third round, and it was just too late. And then the Khalil Roundtree, that's a second life-beating fight. So he moves up to 205 briefly, and he takes on Vinicio Moreira. I'll let you tell the viewers if they want to go to Vinicio or Moreira, but it's like that's just the UFC being like, dude, we really feel sorry for you here. No more three-fight winning streak or losing streak for you here. Get the Vinicio Moreira treatment. And he beats him. And then, boy, oh, boy, would you know, he beats T- Gerald Mearshart, sorry, a split decision in a tit-for-tat striking match. This guy can't outstrike Tim Williams. This guy can't outstrike Jeremy Shard. He's not wrestling anybody. What the fuck does, does he do well? He literally does nothing well, and he fights really bad game plans, but he does got big power. So we would have to fully buy into Jocko's chin being gone, but I think Jocko can out-wrestle him. I think Jocko's going to look to out-wrestle him, and when it's in the open field, I still think Jocko's slightly at work. So even though Jocko's, his work rate's not great either, he still outworks him in the open field. He works him in the clinch. Maybe if he gets him down, if he does get him down, great. He just, he's just going to work him for a shit fucking decision, get the decision, and we're all going to move on. But Jocko is the play at 140. We move or, on. My, yeah, minus 140. We move on down the card to a fight. That may not happen. <laughs> we got uh, Song Yidong taking on Marlon Chito Vera. Uh, Song Yidong minus 185, Chito Vera plus 160. Um, so yeah, Song Yidong is dealing with uh, visa issues. I just read, uh, we're doing this literally like right after the weigh-ins ended. So this stuff's a little bit still up in the air. Uh, Helwani just said on his Twitter that there is some optimism that the fight between Marlon Vera and Song Yidong will continue as scheduled. I don't know what the visa issues are. He's obviously been over here, but obviously they're running into some sort of issue in terms of whether or not he can work um, during this time. Uh, Uriah Faber stepped on the scales, to everyone's surprise, this morning, weighing in 153.5 pounds. So he will be taking on Marlon Vera, should Song Yidong, who trains at Team Alpha Male, so it kind of makes sense, um, should he not be able to, uh, to fight. Um, I w- watching a little bit of tape, I like Yidong here... I have him on a parlay with somebody else a little bit later da- later on down the card. I think he's faster. I think I don't think Cheeto Vera can really take him down or uh, dominate in any sort of grappling exchanges. Um, obviously, Yudong. I think that that fight against Stamen, you know, losing a point early and. And having to really fight through it, get into a lot of scrambles with a guy with a decent wrestling pre- pedigree like that, I think it will be good for a 22-year-old kid like this uh, moving forward. I'm expecting to see a better Song Yudong should he be able to fight um, coming out of this. I think he's a little bit faster, a little bit crisper, kind of everywhere. He is my pick. I'm not loving it as it gets closer to minus 200 as a price. I think I, uh, I have him on the parlay and it was at minus 170. Uh, what's your take here, Cody? Oh, yeah, dude. I went down the rabbit hole hard on this matchup. I don't know why. Shouldn't have done it, but went down the rabbit hole hard. So when I saw that Song Yudong might not fight, I was like, God damn it. Like, what a waste of time. But but here's a funny little thing that I noticed in going down that rabbit hole. Marlon Vera is Oh, definitely along the lines of an Anthony Smith or a Derek Lewis mm-hmm. in just 
massively overachieving in spots with cool little finishes that, you know, keep his name out there. It's fun to watch. You want to see him on a car because you know you're going to get a fun fight. But it's like, boy, oh boy, all the way back to his debut, right? He lost his debut against Marco Beltran, right? But where I'm going with this is that he lost the first round. He lost the fight, but he also just, he lost the first round, barely. Roman Salazar, his next fight. Paul, he lost the first round against Roman Salazar, but he finished him in the second. Next fight, Davey Grant. He loses the first round. In fact, he loses all three. He had 30-26, 30-26, 30-25 against Davey Grant. <clears throat> Wing Yu Ning, he loses a round two. Brad Pickett. Brad Pickett's up two rounds on him before he catches Brad Pickett. Brian Kelleher, he finishes him in the first round. Round that rounded. John Lineker. John Lineker beat him by decision, but again, Vera lost the first round. Douglas the Andrade won every single round again, but won the first round. Uji Buren won the first round again against him. Guido Canetti won the first round against him. It's like, God damn, he's a slow starter. So he's going down rounds against basically everybody. He's always losing his first round. The problem is, is when you're fighting Nohalee Hernandez and Guido Canetti and Wuji Buren, it's like uh, you, eventually the finish is materializing against these guys. So as such, he goes on these nice little winning streaks, and he's coming into this fight on a five-fight winning streak. But largely, it's like I'm not seeing a ton out of him. He's getting outstruck in the exchanges. His wrestling's not great. It's just he's you know got some crafty submissions, and he's generally, for the most part, fighting a, a lower level of opponent. Song Yudong, Song Yudong's got a lot of great things going for him, but namely, let's start with the fact that he's 22 years old. Mm -hmm. So that Cody Stamen draw, that's huge for him. Because you come into the UFC and you're just like a young kid, and you got to get reps against increasingly tougher and tougher level of opposition. Vince Morales, no joke, but he's not even a top 25 guy. Alejandro Perez, no joke, but he's not even a top 25 guy. Cody Stamen's borderline top 15 guy. So it's the trajectory of a good young fighter that's moving up. He lost that fight. He's lucky it was a draw, including the fact that he lost a point to begin with as well. I don't know why it remained a draw, but all the same. He, he's got, he's going to benefit from that learning and going a hard three rounds, tiring out and, and developing, right? But he comes into this fight, Paul, at 145 pounds. Because mind you, they're both 135ers yeah. fighting at 145. Okay, here's my theory on this one. Song Yudong was going to go to 145 regardless of what the situation is. Almost all of his fights on the Chinese regional scene prior to coming to the UFC, and he's like 19, 20 years old, mm -hmm. right? Or at 145 pounds. Yeah. When he debuts in the UFC, he debuted in the UFC at 145 pounds. Then he drops down to 135, beats Felipe Ranches, Vince Morales, Alejandro Perez, has the draw with Cody Stamen. Mind you, now he's 22. Now he's developing. Now he's getting bigger. Now he's adding on muscle. Now he's maturing. Now he's got, you know... Uh, more testosterone in him. He's just growing. So he's going back to his regular class of 145. Marlon Vera, meanwhile, is an absolute career 135er who is actually preparing to fight Ray fucking Borg last week. Ray Borg is in flyweight Ray Borg. Mm -hmm. Ray Borg is in looks small at 135 Ray Borg. Now he's fighting 145 pounds. His best key here is not an outstrike. He's not going to outstrike Song Yudong. He needs to, fight to get, needs to get the fight to the ground. That's going to be harder against the 45er. And also, Song Yudong coming out of alpha male, it's like you don't fucking think he's ever wrestled before. So he keeps the fight standing and he chops him away. So I do have Song Yudong. My last thing that I want to add to this one, fight goes the distance is plus 110. Mm -hmm. That's crazy to me. Because I'm telling you, I got Song Yudong. So let's assume Song Yudong does win. Cheeto Vera's got a cast iron chin. Mm -hmm. Five career losses, every single loss he's had has been by decision, right? Yeah. Guy went three fucking rounds with John Lineker, lost the first two, yeah. and the third round he's chasing Lineker down, going for it. He can fucking take it. So if Song Yudong just goes out there, wins the first round, wins the second round, keep in mind Song Yudong got tired against Vince Morales in the third round. He was tired against Vince Morales in the third round. Yep. He was really tired against Cody Stamen, but that one's understandable. Five takedowns, a lot more grappling. A lot more transition, had to, had to get sweeps. Like that one's more understandable, but his cardio is not great. So if he just chews up Vera for the first two rounds, takes the third round off, Vera does his classic little comeback, doesn't submit him, doesn't knock him out. This one goes the distance, plus 110 fight goes the distance. And as well, if you are going to take Song Yudong, I think you just not in all your shares, especially if you're parlaying them. But yeah, why not have some shares of Song Yudong specifically by decision? Seems to make sense to me. I'm going to. Make that bet in a second. The uh, fight uh, fight goes to decision. 
I see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Plus 110 in one spot. It's moving up to minus 120 in others. You can. The people are starting to look at it now, Paul. People are starting to look at yeah, it. Yeah, it's minus 150. Risky, or wait. No, fight does. Okay, yeah. Fight does. Yeah, plus 100. You can get it. Yeah, it's going to move for sure. So uh, hopefully we can get on that. Let's move on. We've got uh, Miguel Beza taking on Matt the Immortal Brown. Miguel Beza, minus 155. Favorite Matt Brown could be had for plus 135. Already made a bet on this one, Cody. Um, last night, it was like minus 200, plus 170. Took the shot on Matt Brown. Why? Went back, watched Miguel Beza's... Uh, I know he was had the Contender Series fight, but his actual UFC debut against Hector fucking Urbina. And I know that he got the body kick in round two. And he was landing some nice leg kicks. So was Hector Urbina. And honestly, watching Beza, there wasn't much volume going out there. If Matt Brown can force this up against the cage, use his gritty experience to hold this kid back, push him to the cage, make this a dirty fight like we know Matt Brown can do. I mean, at plus 170, I think it was worth a shot. I think this is a straight pick I don't. I didn't really understand why people were betting Chalk Miguel Beza. Like, I think the kid's super, super green. Obviously, you know, a big kick to the liver. Matt Brown could crumble for sure. But I know Matt Brown's going to go out there. He's going to fight for my money. At plus 170, I had to lock it in. Um, and honestly, I think it, at worst, should be a pick Maybe even Matt Brown a favorite. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I actually got Matt Brown in the spot as well. I, I found the money, when it opened, right, I found it absolutely puzzling. I thought to myself, is there another Beza I'm not thinking of? Is there of? another like, Matt no Brown? Way, this is Miguel <laughs> Beza I'm thinking. Yeah, is there another Matt Brown? Did yeah. CJ Brown change his name to Matt and move up a couple weight classes? What the fuck is going on here? I just, I couldn't figure it out. So I'm like, oh, geez, is Matt Brown washed? And you look at his last couple of fights, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't seem that way. So, like, well, what's what's the read on Bayes? I'm not fully understanding it. What I'm thinking, this is a greasy theory because it's like, how the fuck would you actually know? But there's a lot of there's a lot of I don't know why the bookie actually opened it up. That doesn't make sense to me. But honestly, Bayes is 27 years old and he's eight and zero. And when you put his picture and his record and that number alone right next to Matt Brown's 39 and his 22 and 16 and his and his beat up face. I just feel like people assume that the younger, quicker athlete's going to get after him. And in very similar to last week's main event, that's not the fucking case. Mm-hmm. That's not the case at all. You want to talk about how ridiculous the line is when it opened? Okay, Miguel Beza had has had one fight in the UFC. Okay, he fought the worst guy in the division. Literally the worst. There's, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, literally the worst. I'm not even just saying that to be like distasteful or anything like that. Literally the worst guy in the division, and an argument that one of the worst fighters to appear in the division in the last ten years. So so when does it matter? Okay, he's got one fight in the UFC. Matt Brown has 25 fights in the UFC. You want to talk about quarantine? You want to talk about these guys not having full fight camps? I said this to you and Pat Mayo when we discussed this quarantine situation. I said the savvy veterans are going to perform in these situations Mm -hmm. because the savvy veterans have been so fucking many fights. Mm -hmm. They're going to – they're they're, they're more comfortable. They're more comfortable. The fans aren't there. Whatever. I used to fight in tons of stadium shows with no fans. Or yeah. not stadium, you know what I mean? Little backwater events with no fans. These guys understand pressure. They understand all that. You got a guy that's got eight fights in Beza. Eight fights, okay? He didn't look good on the contender series. He got bailed out by a couple of shots. He was losing a round. And then he would land a punch that was like, oh, well, that's the most significant punch of the round. It hurt his opponent. His opponent, Victor Reyes, bottom of the barrel. Kombache America fighter, 10-3 and three record, has a loss to my boy, Mark Stevens. Hardcores will understand that name. It's not a good win. He shouldn't have gotten gifted a contract either, but he gets a contract. He eh, looks athletic. He throws some kicks out there. Let's give him the worst guy that's competed in this division in quite some time, Hector Aldana. And what do you know? The guy basically doesn't put out a great performance. He finishes him, but like you said, it's a lot of low output. Mm-hmm. First round, it's like, oh, geez, you know, he, he lands like 14. It's 14 to 4. It, yeah, exactly. Like Aldana, Aldana lands four strikes in the first round. It's like, mm-hmm. how can you even use that as a barometer test of if this guy's any good? Exactly. Like, oh, well, he hurts him with a kick to the body, and Matt Brown's been hurt a lot of times with a kick to the body. It's like, I'm not going to bet a guy who was nearly a 2-to-1 favorite when the line came out based on that thesis. Like, yeah. I, I, 
I can't even indulge. And you know what? As much as I say Matt Brown's a 25-fight UFC veteran, that's not even including three fights on The Ultimate Fighter where he fought UFC veterans like Jeremy May and Amir Sadala. Prior to coming to the UFC, he had fought UFC veterans Chris Lytle. He fought UFC veterans Chris Liguori and Pete Spratt and has a win over Douglas Lima. Like, the guy is as battle-tested and true as you could possibly want. So, okay, is he washed? Uh, he went tit-for-tat with Donald Cerrone in a war and then got knocked out. That took some out of him, no doubt. But then he comes back, and he looks great against Sanchez. And the Ben Saunders fight, I'll admit, dude, it looked like he was walking in sand. Like, he was very slow in that fight. That It looked bad. But keep in mind, he's stuck in a triangle choke for, like, four minutes yep. in the first round. And like, he never I quits. That's another, and that's another thing I love about this guy. You know how many people will quit when they were in Ben Saunders' best, best submission spot early in the fight? There's not an ounce of sweat on either one of these guys. Like, that is Ben Saunders... And Matt Brown is not going to quit. He's the kind of guy you you want to bet on, just because like as long as he doesn't get turned unconscious, he is fighting for my money. Yeah, yeah. And and as far as I'm concerned, Beza couldn't even knock out Victor Reyna. He had a split decision over Leo um, Valvita. You can find that fight online. It's like what he, there's no indication he's even a power puncher. No. So he fucking landed a leg kick on Hector Aldana. It was that a body, like, body kick to him. He landed a bunch of leg yeah, kicks. His yeah, leg but, kicks are pretty kick good. And but. ground and pound on the ground. Right. He does have a good kick game. And so I, I, I'll fully admit, I'll fully admit, the path to victory, because you can't discredit any opponent. Of course. The path to victory is definitely there. Yeah. Stay on the outside. Just be on your back toe the entire time. He is too slow to track you down. I'll admit. Matt Brown back in the day used to cut better angles and used to track guys. He, he's, he's very slow footed right now. I do believe that, uh, that, Basil will be able to just dance around him. But honestly, in this setting of like, there's no crowd there, mm-hmm. and you can hear everything. Once this guy starts getting on you, and you start breathing, and you start tiring, and you start getting slower, and he's still there like a Glover. Glover is so much slower than Anthony Smith. Mm-hmm. But you, you can't just keep that pace forever when a guy's on your ass. And like you said with Matt Brown, the no quit on him, he's always on your ass. The only way he's not on your ass is if you take him out. And I don't mean drop him with a body kick where he's hurt. If he gets back up, you know the fights where he's been dropped but got back up? Motherfucker comes on twice as strong. Like, uh, you got to make sure you shut the lights out on him. And I, I just I just don't know. Beza, I'm so far removed from Beza. Although, I'll give my boy MMA Lock of the Night a shout of the night. The guy's a super smart guy. He knows what he's talking about. He likes Beza. You know, i got some other buddies that seem to like Beza, but it, they're basing it straightly, seemingly basing it on athleticism. And even though I see that side of it, it's like for the type of money that they were offering, and even now, he's still the underdog now. He's like, fuck, Matt Brown. Yeah, let's go for it. All right, moving on down, we've got Kevin Holland taking on Anthony Hernandez. It's a straight pick em. Watching tape, I was like, oh, man, I would love to bet Kevin Holland here if I didn't think he was going to do something really fucking stupid, Cody. Um the guy, all right, so here's the thing. He's got like a five-inch reach advantage in this fight. He's three inches taller. Honestly, looking at Anthony Hernandez, he looks like a 170-pounder. And Kevin Holland is a very, very tall, long, 185-pounder. Obviously, they're both middleweights, but like Anthony Hernandez, I'm surprised fights at this weight class. He just looks smaller than all of his opponents. If Kevin Holland, you see some like instances with him. It's just like when he's, when he's fighting at range, fighting long, throwing those long legs. I have no idea what his leg reach advantage is, but like it's probably massive. Um, when he's fighting at range... Doing all that, he looks pretty good. Like, that is a good, a perfect path to victory for this guy. Problem is, is that he's going to shoot in for some sort of takedown needlessly. He's going to fight in the clinch needlessly. He's going to get into these weird scrambles needlessly. He's a kind of guy that's just like, I would love to bet you, you actually have more skills than this guy, or than Anthony Hernandez. But I just don't trust you to not do something stupid. So it, right now, it ends up being a pass for me, but I'd like to bet Holland. What about you? Yeah, yeah I, I don't even know. Like, I And I hear what you're saying with Anthony Hernandez being a smaller guy at the weight class, and that should be important when you look at Kevin Holland being six foot three. But here's the anomaly to me with Kevin Holland. He weighed in in his last fight against Brandon Allen at 183 and a half, which I found to be odd because it's like, God, he seems like a big enough guy. Why, why would you overshoot your weight cut by like two and a half pounds? And then he weighed in today at 182 and a half. 
So why, 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 is that what he walks around at? I like, guess. why would you even cut weight at all? Like, how are you missing weight? You can come in at 186. Why would you come in at 182 and a half and give away the three and a half pounds? Like, I don't know. So when you talk about Hernandez not particularly being the biggest guy, like, it's possible, like, Kevin Holland not exactly the biggest guy as well. Like, I don't really know what to make out of that, to be honest with you. I, I was big on Anthony Hernandez coming into the UFC because, again, this is a guy that was an LFA champion and, <laughs> drum roll, please, beat Brandon Allen to get the title. But his Dana White Contender Series fight, like, he smoked through Jordan, right? He looked good. Then he popped for weed, whatever. It's no contest. That's so stupid. But he let me down hard in the Marcus Perez fight where it's like you see where this guy is limited. Uh, he's just still very green. You know, these guys are going to benefit from a lot of fights at the lower level before making that jump up. Kevin Holland represents seemingly maybe at that lower level opponent, but not. Nah, he's a 21 fight veteran. He's fought in the UFC. He's got his bearings about him and he presents a lot of variables as well. So this fight really could go either way. I got Hernandez based on, I just think he's faster. I think the problem with Holland being six foot three is that He's not a great athlete. Like He's slow to react a little bit. Hernandez should be able to beat him to the punch, get on the inside, maybe drag him to the ground. When he does drag him to the ground, Holland's just all over the place. Like The fight with Mearshart was a very big indicator of I like mean, why you probably can't trust this guy. I don't know if it's Hernandez guy's all that great on the ground either. Like... Like Marcos, no, no. Marcus yeah. Perez was like was beating the shit out of him and like grappling, man. Ah, Perez isn't so bad. He's more of like a, he's like, a Anaconda, he's, nasty. he's like a karate guy for the most part. I mean, yeah, I don't know, man. I think this. I mean, both of them are. This is low level middleweight affair for sure. I don't know. It's a tough call, but you like Hernandez. I like Holland. Doesn't sound like either either one of us are all that confident though. Yeah. yeah, let's move on. We've got uh, Courtney Casey taking on Mara Romero Barella. Courtney Casey minus 155 favorite, Barella plus 135. Usually concerned, especially the glass card, I believe, people moving up in weight. You know, the old quarantine 15, putting on those extra little bit of pounds, not a good sign for a lot of people. Um, what was it, 4 and 1 last card? I think Brian Kelleher was the only one who was like moving up that fight and uh and got the win. Um, yeah. you know, you had OSP take the L. There's uh yeah, basically moving up to a non natural weight class at least last card. Obviously small sample didn't play out very well for uh for them. Courtney Casey moving up from 115 to 125 here. It'll be the first time that she's ever really been smaller than her opponent. She's um, one inch taller, but giving up two inches of reach. Definitely not as thick as Mara Romero Barella. But I think this really will come down to Barella's only real path is going to be like cage stalling, holding up, and tr like maybe have a, a strength advantage against Courtney Casey. Because if it just stays on the feet and it's just volume, I, I, I find a hard... I, I find it hard to believe that Courtney Casey just won't win on sheer volume. Courtney Casey by decision. Uh, she was actually the second leg of my Song Yadong Courtney Casey parlay. She was at minus 150, and he was at minus 170. I think it came out to plus 165, all said and done. What's your take on Casey versus Bro? Hey, yeah, I'm going to take a hard pass on this one. Honestly, Courtney Casey should win this fight if all things are equal, which they're not because of the weight class jump. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't think she was a very small 115-pound fighter, so it's very possible that it's a natural transition for, to 125, and, and there's no problem here. But again, as you noted, and that was a big thing I was looking at as well, is that fighters that are moving up a weight class during the quarantine are not faring particularly well. Um, I, it's just not, I don't know, maybe it's not comparable comfortable for them who knows but her giving up probably one of her best assets where that she's big at 115 coming up to 125 i don't know it fits just a straight grappling match right corny casey i believe is a brown belt her husband's a black belt um sanchez against barella who's got decent jiu-jitsu as well if it plays out just as a, a grappling exchange then i mean you kind of tend to favor mara or barella a little bit just because she's that bigger fighter she's actually completed a takedown in all of her UFC fights. Win or lose, she goes in there, she gets a takedown. Her striking is something she's not particularly apt with. So that's what's going to be a big problem. If she doesn't get Courtney Casey to the ground, Courtney Casey just throws three times more punches and is a better boxer, has better kicks, you know, has a good chin on her, will march her down. She needs to get this fight to the ground. 
But for the most part, her UFC debut against Faria, she got her down. Caitlin Chikagan, hard to even track her down to get a hold of her, but she got her down. Talia Santos got her down twice. Laura Murphy, very tough and rugged, got her down. Montana De La Rosa, a grappler, a wrestler, got her down. So, I mean, it would be an indication that, okay, she could probably get a takedown in this fight. Well, how good's Courtney Casey's takedown defense? Well, that's where you run into a problem. Actual wrestlers, they take her down, no problem. Ronda mm-hmm. Marcos got her down. Um, Claudia Gadelia got her down six times. Jessica Aguilar, who was washed a bit, but is a wrestler, got her down four times. It's non-wrestlers, like M- uh, Michelle Watterson took her down three times. Angela Hill took her down. Felice Herrig took her down. If those girls who are all small 115, Angela Hill is very small for 115. Michelle Watterson is very small for 115. Felice Herrig is perfect size for 115, but isn't particularly big for the weight class. Jessica Aguilar is not very big for 115 either. They're all taking you down. Then, then you kind of got to think that uh, Merle Burrell has never fought down that weight class. She's a career 25. She's got that size. She's got the ability to maybe get a hold of Courtney Casey and get her to the ground. And if it's just a bigger fighter with top control for a couple rounds, and it ends up being a dirty split decision, fuck, you know, I, don't, I might as well take the underdog for, for if you look at it that way. So, honestly, your smart position is probably a pass here. But considering it was 140, Courtney Casey, I just didn't agree with that. I thought it's a pick-em fight. The weight class thing has me nervous. And I think Borrella has a path to victory in that. Get this fight to the ground and just get on top. Don't, don't strike with it. Don't strike with it. Not a good idea. Use your striking long enough to get a hold of her, get her to the ground, and then just, just play that game. Ah, fair enough. I'm not gonna. F- I'm not gonna fight with you about uh, Courtney Casey. A Courtney Casey fight here. Um, you could win. Yeah, whatever. Um, let's move on because I, I know that you're much more fired up about this one. I'm gonna let you take this one away. Darren Elkins taking on Nate the Train. Right, Nate the Train. Nate the Train, baby. Nate the Train, Landwehr. Uh, Darren Elkins minus one thirty. Landwehr is plus one ten. Take it away. Yeah, I mean, I had a big old egg on my face after Landwehr's debut, that's for sure. This guy's accomplished a lot as far as fighting in Russia goes. I know he's 31, so you can't consider him a prospect by no stretch. But that's why kind of why I liked him. I mean, he had already built his chops. He doesn't need a few UFC fights to get acclimated to the scene. He should already be good. Comes into the UFC, strange matchup with Herbert Burns, and then, like, Nate's takedown defense is there, but it's not great. And I'm worried if Herbert Burns does get him down, maybe he submits. And Burns just gets him into a you know a bad spot immediately so my boy nate the train is gonna prove everybody he fights out of it now it's his time now he starts bombing and he gets to work and he walks straight into the knee now props to herbert burns for not landing the knee for throwing up the knee to which landwehr ran fucking hate first into it ko'd him brutal it was a bad ko paul this fight is less than four months later so my you know, spoiler, I am picking it. It's like, I can't deny that it's like, we got some red flags right off the get-go. The other red flag being that, again, his takedown defense isn't great, and historically Darren Elkins is just that tough, blue nose, blue chip, just stick stick at you, keep grinding, get you down, keep working at you. If you look at it from a style class point of view in that regard, it's just like, yeah, Nate Landwehr could be in trouble, but I'm going with the angle of that Darren Elkins is faded. I mean, actually, Saturday is his 36th birthday. So he's been fighting in the sport for a long time. He's got a lot of mileage on him. You know, the tattoo on his chest, damage. Uh, it, it pretty much sums up this guy's career in a nutshell. He, he has absorbed a lot of damage. There's no doubt about it that at his highest of his highs, three, two, three years ago, he's on a nice little winning streak. He beats mid-level talent. He has a big upset over Merced Bektic. He got a squeaker over Dennis Bermudez. Oh, Michael Johnson win. That's all like in the rearview mirror. Again, he took a, a step up in class, but now you're seeing where he is a limited guy. Right? Volkanovski put a good beating on him. Lamas put an epic beating on him because prior to that, you know, Elkins was a guy that rarely, rarely got stopped due to strikes. But, mm-hmm. I mean, Lamas put a thrashing on him. And then the, the Ryan Hall fight. If the Ryan Hall fight had never happened, I had never seen it. I would just chalk up the Volkanovski and Lamas thing to, eh, you know what I mean? Yeah, he, big step just, up in competition. He wasn't ready for that level. Yeah, the Hall fight made no sense because it's like he's not going to take you down and you're not going to take him down. It's probably the smart call here. So mm-hmm. why don't you just keep the fight standing, grind on him, standing against the cage and just maul on him. But it's like he just couldn't. You really saw it's like he's not a great athlete mm-hmm. at all. He's just a tough, grindy son of a bitch that makes it a fight. That was that able to capitalize off of other guys gassing against him. He had the Homer Simpson strategy when Homer Simpson goes on his run. From like boxcar Joe to uh, 
to uh, Dredrick Tatum, where it's just like you basically beat the piss out of him for the first 12 minutes, and if you're hanging on a thread, maybe he can take you out or, or, uh, and make it interesting at the end. Yeah, he's always been a guy who rested on that chin. Yeah, you know what, dude, a hundred, a hundred percent. And you know what, we haven't played this game in a long time, right? But these are his wins in order of the UFC. Dwayne Ludwig cut from the organization. I'll do that for Michinaro you. Michinaro Omagawa. Ti Kwan Zhang. Oh, we shouldn't do uh, this this done. way because you're getting the delay. So yeah, you just keep going. Yeah, either way, yeah, well, either I'll, way, I'll, yeah, his opponent. Right, right, right. Just, just. Right, just to rifle it through though, take Juan Zhang, cut from the organization. Mm-hmm. Bring in Brian, uh, Diego Brando, cut. Steven Siler, cut. Antonio Carvalho, cut. Lost to Chad Mendez, who retired, but that was a loss. Hatsuyoki, again, we're going back to the wins here. Mm-hmm. Who, he beat Hatsuyoki, cut. Lucas Martins, cut. Robert Whiteford, cut. Chaz Kelly, I like Chaz Kelly. Chaz Kelly's not cut. But Godofredo Pepe, the next opponent, cut. Mursad Bektic is not the prospect we thought he was. No. Elkins was getting straight beat the fuck up for two rounds. And Merside tired, and you're right. He capitalized on somebody else's faulty gas tank and mistake. Capitalizes. Dennis Bermudez, retired from the sport. He squeaked by him on that one. Michael Johnson. I'm telling you, Michael Johnson is likely now cut from the organization. He was getting his ass kicked in the first round. Three to one on the striking numbers. And he's getting beat up here against Johnson. In the second round, Johnson going to Johnson. And Elgin gives the fight to the ground. And Johnson gives up his back immediately, gives up the rear naked choke. Unbelievable. When he takes a higher level of competition, those lucky moments don't create themselves. So anyways, now I have to convince you why Nate Landwehr is an upper echelon level talent. And I don't know that he necessarily is. I just think he's going to have enough to beat Elkins. He's got to keep this fight standing. He's going to make Elkins work. And he's just got to start bombing on him. If Elkins' chin is compromised, that's one thing that Landwehr does very well is that he just keeps coming. When he was fighting in Russia, it was no problem for him to lose the first round based on maybe getting taken down, maybe getting controlled a little bit, maybe getting worked a little bit. But he just he keeps coming on you and does have that big power. The other thing, too, that really flies under the radar with Nate Langler is that he was actually a, a standout high school track star. He ran a 4-4 in the 40-yard dash, right? I mean, he was he pretty out impressive. Big school. Wow. He went to uh, – yeah, I know, I know. He, the guy is fucking a great athlete. Even though he's 31 years old, he still runs a lot. Mm-hmm. He's got great cardio. So Elkins has made a career on breaking guys with spotty gas tanks. But, like, this guy, this guy should be able to keep up with it. Now, I know he ran headfirst into a knee, and that's fucking awful. But if I could pick an opponent that's not likely going to test his chin in this fight, it might be Darren Elkins. He's not exactly point, yeah. known for punching power abilities, right? So, again, I'm convincing myself into Nate Landwehr because I'm not ready to bail on him. But I've seen worse matchups, and I'm willing to give Nate the train another shot, obviously, my guy. So, sign me up for Nate the train, Landwehr. Fuck it. All right, and finally, we go to the bottom of the barrel of the heavyweight division where we have Dante Mays taking on Rodrigo Nascimento, basically a straight pick him here. I actually, um, uh, watching Rodrigo, there's not much tape on Rodrigo, uh, clearly. There's his uh, Dana White Contender Series fight taking on like some like Slavic like hockey player. And that dude tries to get a takedown, like tries to get like a head and arm like throw on him. Or what is it? Uh, what's the one that they always do in women's MMA? Head and arm throw, right? Yeah, like basically yeah, yeah. tries also to do. Basically like try. Yards. Yeah, this Martinek guy basically tries to do that, and then Nascimento just falls on top of him. Um, so I was watching it, watching what tape I could, watched a bunch of his, like, I went on his Insta, I was creeping the guy's Instagram and stuff like that, trying to figure out what this guy's all about. I don't know if he's anything special, but Dante Mays is so sloppy. Um, like, the striking is just super, super wild. He comes out, and he'll try to throw a flying knee, but, like, there's not really much form there. He's, given, he's got a little bit of a, of a height advantage, one-inch reach advantage. I've really only seen, in terms of Nassimento striking, like mostly like him hitting a bag, which is not great. So I, I made a little play on Nassimento plus 100 last night. Um, may not be the best play, but based on like Mays just being so sloppy, I think if we get this to the mat at least one, Nassimento, who trains at ATT, training with a bunch of half-decent dudes, obviously down there at that gym. I think uh, Nascimento has multiple. He may just be cleaner and better on the on the feet as well. So I'm going to take the newcomer against Dante Mayo's. What about you? 
Yeah, okay. So uh, just to, right off the top, me going in down the Marlon Vera rabbit hole definitely took away from me getting time to physically look at this fight. But like you said, there wasn't a whole lot to look at. So the thing with Dante Mans is, yeah, dude, he's so big. He's, he's a threat striker with anybody. Being that he's 6'6 with an 81-and-a-half-inch reach, he doesn't got, like, life-altering power. Like, no. I don't think that's the big thing on him is that there's so many variables in cutting that distance and getting into the pocket. And a lot of guys just, I don't know, aren't able to cut it and manage the distance properly. And as such, uh, you know, he'll just pick away from the outside. The two recent losses on his record that people have been able to watch, so to speak, Alan Crowder and Cyril Gagne, they both just got him to the ground. Once they did get him to the ground, it's like yep. that's definitely the way to go about handling this guy. So with Rodrigo Nascimento, it's like, yeah, maybe he could have strike him. Maybe, maybe he could have strike him. But why? Why even bother? Oh, exactly. Him? And I, I think Nascimento. I think Nascimento. You see him in the in that Martinick fight. Like that's what he wants. He wants to take this to the mat, one hundred percent. Exactly. He wants to get the fight to the ground, and I think that's where his best path is. Now, one thing I really like, well, I know this is going to sound strange, like, why do you really like this? Because as a result, he has not fought in 10 months. But he got the Contender Series contract 10 months ago against mm-hmm. Martinek. He submitted him the first round. He gets a contract. Now that he's got a contract, now that he knows I'm fighting the UFC, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a big-time athlete, I've got some money coming in, I'm at ATT. I'm training with the best guys. I'm looking to build myself. So add 10 months of development on top of what you've seen, he's 27 and he's training at ATT and he was scheduled to fight Mays twice already, but obviously both cards getting canceled. Now he's had time to prep for this guy and his coaches, the best coaches in the world known for coming up with the best game plans in the world would surely have advised him like, yeah, Dante Mays, maybe you can have striking standing, but like he's a fish out of water on the ground. Use your striking to get this guy down. And, when you're six foot six and you have long legs like that, it's very hard to scramble. And that's where Nascimento is going to have the shorter base. He's going to be the heavier guy. He should be able to grind him into the ground. And uh, I don't know, maybe a submission presents itself. Alan Crowder TKO in you because you're so gassed out. Mm-hmm. You just can't get back up. That's a bad sign. Not a good point. look. I'll admit, I'll admit he, he put together a nice little win streak since then. He actually beat Kamaru Usman's brother, Muhammad Usman, if you can believe that one. Um, but it, but he's three and zero, very green, definitely not Kamaru. Like he can pose problems for you, is what I'm saying. But if you don't play into his little game, you just ground this guy right off the get go, and you zap out his energy, no good. And so I, I definitely got to go with a Nascimento. And I think my last point on that one is the weigh-ins today. The weigh-ins today, uh, Dante Males came in at what, like two forty-two, right? Two forty-one. Right. Mm-hmm. And Nascimento came in at 255. So okay. I've just explained to you that, like, not only is the path take this fucking guy down, but, like, once he gets down on him, he's, he's going to be a decidedly pounds. bigger guy, man. Mm-hmm. All right. So I right, want to take so. one shot at you before we get out of here. Shoot. You're saying, I don't know if you're going to bet it, but you were saying that you're, you, you're, you're leaning towards the dog in Casey versus Barella. Friends, well, dog, dog, or pass, or I'm just saying, pa- co- pass could be. Friends <laughs> don't let friends bet on people who got knocked out by Lauren Murphy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Did you? Yeah, yeah. Well, watching that. So I know it was like a weird, like scramble, but like you gotta be mindful. Like I don't think that Courtney Casey is a threat to like knock anybody out, but. Like, her getting back up to her feet in that situation against Murphy was so reckless. She had no, like, she didn't have, she didn't, like, keep her knee down, wasn't safely getting up, keeping the hand down, making sure that she couldn't get kneed in the face. She just tried to just get up without even thinking and just ate a big one. Uh, She had already just got clubbed as well by Lauren Murphy. Like, I... I, I think it's more of a of a pass, I I guess, in my opinion. But that's I just wanted to take a shot at you for for picking somebody who got knocked out by Lauren Murphy. Paul, Paul, I just want to counter one with you, just because you're my boy. So okay. you gotta at least get me. I gotta get a kick I, I, out back I, I, in there. I deserve it. Yeah. Friends, friends, friends don't let friends bet on people whose only TKO victory is over Christina Stancy. So Courtney <laughs> Casey's not exactly a power puncher of any type. I know Christina Stancy has a very, very special place in your heart, Paul Sean. Yeah. So I'll yeah, just she, throw that yeah. one out there. The worst. <laughs> I think I think earlier in the episode I may have said Hector Urbina. I meant Hector Aldana. I don't know whether whether I said Aldana or Urbina. Either way, 
Um, both Hectors were actually horrible. Hector, not a great name. And uh, Hector, Hector Lombard. Yeah, once you get to the UFC, if your name's Hector, typically not a good time. Um, well, I guess that was super fast. Obviously, no DraftKings. This week, we will um, keep you updated as to whether one of us uh, gets eliminated. And I may actually start doing a little side thing um, with other people in the industry. Um, I'll reach out to those people about that. But, um, yeah, I guess uh, all we, gotta no, we do- got to do. We got we got we got Yeah, we got a, a few more things to talk about, if you don't mind. All right, we'll you, jump, yeah, tee it up. We versus Irwin Rivera. Oh, yeah, right? of course. That's not even so- on the list. There's no odds on that fight. I watched some tape on no. Irwin Rivera last night. He's fast. Uh, but he's 135 pounder coming up to 145. Listen, Giga Kachikadze, his entire when he came to the UFC, it's just like, oh, he fought like a two and 31 fighter and like another like 0 and one and like an 0 and eight. Like Giga Kachikadze, if you're gonna make him fight on on short notice, he's taking a squash match, and I think he wasn't gonna accept anything less than like a pretty simple matchup here. Um, his opponent, Erwin Rivera, all of his his wins really come by by knockout using his striking against Chikadz. That's that's a pretty bad path to victory. So coming in short notice, moving up a weight class against a guy with a much better striking pedigree than you. Like Chikadz, I mean, this is not – we're not talking DraftKings. If he stays at 7,000, like he's a free square, you have to play him. Um, and I don't know what the odds are yet for Chikads, but I think he's going to win. What about you? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. We don't know what the odds are, and so trying to cap it myself, it's like it should open no no less than he could cost 500. Like, wow. it's a pretty crazy prospect. And and then you don't want to bet he could Chikads 500 because he has no ground game. So if, for whatever reason, Rivera does, I don't know, Rivera not, doesn't have much of a ground game either. No. But if he decides to toss it up and ends up on top of him, then, like, how, how do you know? But yeah, Giga's a natural 145er. He's a much better striker, and that is Irwin Rivera's wheelhouse, really, is his striking. But, I mean, I don't see him going out there and knocking out Giga in a striking match. You know, a credible glory veteran who on top of that is like, this This is this is what he does. So it's like you've got to rely on that ground game. I'm very familiar with Irwin Rivera. I mean, very familiar. Because of all of his Kambache America fights, prior to that legacy FC, but he fought for Kambache America. And he's one and two in the organization. Did not look good in either of his losses. And probably would not have made the UFC for a very long time had it not for the bin that, bam, we need a short notice guy. Bam, he's a weight class lower and he doesn't mind just jumping up and taking the fight. Perfect. Bam, he's from the Black Zillions camp. So, you know, all of his, he's got teammates. Uh, they're all fighting on these cards because we're in Florida. He's just the natural selection to come in and fill that void. So yeah, he's won his last three fights. If it saves seven thousand dollars on DK, you have it all day. If they open up this line like Giga two forty or Giga three hundred, I think you jump on it. Or yeah. I think you put some definite stock on it. Yeah. Once it gets to like that five, six hundred, it becomes banana peel pricing. Mm-hmm. And Giga Chikots is one of those guys that possibly falls on a banana peel. Um, I know I said I wouldn't mention anything with DK, but I, just to give anybody like a just a bit of help if they need it. And this is just me being honest. Looking at the high end of the DK like plays this week with Mike Davis um, off at mm-hmm. 9,200. The most expensive play is Claudia. And I just talked about how, you know, awful gas tank. She's let everybody down many of times. It could get sloppy. That's, that's your best pick, right? Mm-hmm. Beza, your second best pick. Dude, we, we both just we disagree heavily on that one. Right. Song Dong, he's your third more expensive guy. Keep in mind, Song Dong went to decision both of his last fights. Right, he couldn't knock out Vince Morales or finish Vince Morales, and he got tired of the third round against Vince Morales. Now he's moving up a weight class. Power's not just going to all of a sudden come to him and knocking. And we talked about how how difficult Marlon Vera is to put away. Even though he could be a safe money line pick potentially, he's not a good DraftKings play. Courtney Casey, what? Are you serious? Mm-hmm. We obviously disagree on that one. Walt Harris, I'm okay, not fine. If Walt price. does win. Right, if Walt does win, well, then he guess he would score a lot big with the big power, right? Jocko, always been a historically low score. Barbosa, if Ige's trying to hump him the whole time and grind on him, going to be hard to score. Also, this is a pick and fight, and yet he's 8,500 versus the flip side 77 on Ige. That's strange. Mays, we, just, we, didn't, we don't like him. Elkins, don't like him. Kevin Holland, don't like him. Anthony Hernandez, 
don't like him. And this is where it gets super weird, right? All the cheap plays are the guys that what? I like White Landwehr. Mm-hmm. We both kind of like Nascimento, not too bad. Ige, I'm indifferent to. He wasn't my guy, but you know, we at least agree that he has a chance. Fuck Eric Anders. Uh, <laughs> over him, he's got five rounds to deal with. He's gonna have a chance. Barella, I'm not picking her myself, but it's like, hey, if she does get the takedown, she stays on top. Like she's only seventy four hundred bucks. Marlon Vera, I'm also not on board with him, but all of his wins historically are finished. The guy is a finisher; he goes for it. Matt Brown, buddy. Matt Brown's guaranteed excitement. You know he's going to dig in and go for it, and he's 7,200 bucks. Angela Hill could score 100 strikes plus if Gidella doesn't just take her down, which I have a feeling Gidella will. And then you got Giga, who's seven thousand dollars and is the best play on the entire card. Mm-hmm. So good luck, my friends. There's your DK breakdown, and <laughs> even if you, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do, so how can I give you advice on what to do? Fuck, it's a wacko week, buddy. I'm, if if Giga stays at seven thousand, I'm. I mean, I'm leaving. A shit ton of of capital or a, a shit ton of salary on the board basically is what's happening this week. Ninety five percent ownership, you know, because you'll as he should be though. Players. It's like especially because at that price, all he needs to do is win. Like we don't, you don't, you, you, you don't need him to get a hundred points, right? Like he gets a decision win, scores seventy four. You're laughing, right? So, you know, you know what? I'm gonna go on record and say this right now, DK. If you're listening, this is all you got to do, right? <laughs> Just switch it. Just switch it. Davis was ninety two hundred. Yeah. Giga should now be ninety two hundred dollars. Yeah. And Irwin Rivera should be seven thousand. That's literally all you got to do. That's Just that's how to keep very easy. the slate's integrity. Because otherwise, yeah, ninety five percent of people, as they should, will own Giga, Giga Chikats. Um. All right. All right. Yeah, for sure. We'll get out of here as soon as you uh, drop the PRP on these fools. Okay. So yeah enough the PRP we are going with Alistair Overeem dog number one Clyde Gadelia Edson Barbosa Jotko uh, Sonia Dong Matt Brown dog number two Anthony Hernandez Giga Chikot Nate Landwehr dog number three I'm, I'm going to take Barella. It's a probably good pass, but I'm giving you the PRP. And that's going to be our dog number four. And then we're going to take Nascimento as even money. So you're going to have four dogs on that. The prop play I like best on this card is the Marlon Barrow, Yelp Song Yudon, to go distance. Uh, and yeah, the, the, I don't know. Like, I'd hate to say my confident plays on this card. The guys like Song Yudon, but it, I think we've agreed on that one. But like Jocko, like, you know, I'm going to need a few more, probably at least another day. I'll be studying up until five, six o'clock tomorrow, right? Because there's just been such a quick turnaround. Uh, I feel confident in Jocko. I really do. Mm-hmm. I'd like to feel more confident in Jocko before I lay that. Fair. But minus 149, bad price tag. I think he gets the job done. So this is a fun card, lots of potential. We're, we're on a – I mean, our quarantine here is sitting at two out of three, right? Look, this is the last one to cap it off. But at the same time, just beware. Don't be giving your money back to the bookie. This is what the bookie plans on. They want to catch you off guard. Oh, Faber's in. Oh, Faber's not in. Oh, Giga's the biggest dog on the card against Mike. Day. Oh, no, he's the biggest favorite on the card. Like, <laughs> It's going on all, all, all types of madness. So just uh, a keep in mind, buyers beware. Good luck to everybody. And uh, looking forward to it, Paul, my man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So obviously UFC off next week. They're obviously, they're hoping that they can be back at the apex for that card on the 30th. And then there's a pay-per-view on June 7th. And tons of UFC action. You know that me and Cody... We'll be here to break down every single possible UFC card that could possibly happen uh, during this time of need. Thanks to all the new fans and stuff that have kind of popped up. We see all of your comments and stuff. We're just we're getting we're getting used to the. Uh, there's a little bit more engagement than what we're used to. So we see all of your comments. Thanks for all the support and everything like that. I think that wraps it up for us. For Cody Saftik, I am Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Experience. Experience!